In this video, we're taking a closer look at solar power systems for homes. Solar power is often associated with living off-grid, but surprisingly there's a lot more people installing solar panels on homes that are connected to the grid. So we met up with Albert from iSolera to learn about why people are installing solar at home, the basic components of a solar power system, installation options for panels, costs and money-saving opportunities like net metering, and important considerations including some of the risks to keep in mind when going solar. We're covering a lot in just 10 minutes, so let's get into it. The sun rises every day and it's a guaranteed energy source. So as we transition to more electrically based infrastructure, so heating, cooling, transportation, all of it is gonna need a renewable energy source. And solar's part of that solution. Solar's gonna be able to deliver an infinite amount of energy. We just gotta be able to capture it, harvest it, utilize it. Yeah, so the reason why people invest in solar, cost savings is a big one. They're trying to insulate themselves from rising electrical costs or uncertainty of power or unreliable power if you're in like a rural setting. People are trying to be more sustainable so that they look at solar and they go, well, I don't need to do an extreme thing. I just have to add panels to my house and I'm gonna to continue to use electricity the way I normally do, but I'm gonna get some sort of benefit from doing it. And the big one now I'm finding is that people are really looking and targeting batteries, and it's because maybe the grid isn't as reliable as they thought. They're more likely to have outages, and the frequency is increasing, and the duration is increasing. So solar plus battery and storage allows people to kind of continue to live their lives without that inconvenience of wondering, is my fridge gonna last the next couple days? Do I still have access to water? Um, and again, it really depends on your, where you live, that whether or not that's a big problem for you, but a lot of people are really interested in just trying to insulate themselves from that risk. So the opportunity when you grid tied or off grid, solar is gonna provide you a benefit. Every day it's gonna generate electricity. You're either gonna use it, you're gonna sell it, you're gonna store it, you're gonna do something with it that's gonna give you a benefit. So like basic components of a solar power system is you need a solar panel. That's what's actually gonna take sunlight and turn it into power. Um, in order to get that power into a usable form, you need some sort of inverter, and then you need a racking system. So you would need those three pieces. If you're grid tied, you might need some additional electrical components. And as more and more batteries come to market, there's more and more opportunity to couple a solar panel and an inverter to a battery system to further get more utility and have more benefit. For residential, the most common types of installs a roof mount because they have existing infrastructure that can support panels. So it's facing south or east or west or ground mounts. And that usually just comes down to viable space so both have their pros and cons, but pretty much every residential customer starts with, I'd like to add solar, and we look at what existing infrastructure can be best utilized to achieve those goals. So as far as requirements for like a roof mount, solar can go on asphalt shingles, tile shingles, clay tiles, literally the racking system exists that you can build on any roof. So there really aren't too many limitations as far as what kind of roofing type, but you typically want a roof that's in good condition. So kind of from day one, you want to determine, is this roof going to outlast potentially the performance of the solar system? If not, if there are ways that I should mitigate that cost now. You might want to sh re-shingle if the shingles are showing their age. A lot of these components are fixtures, so they can be removed, but there is costs associated with installing and uninstalling something that's functioning to replace the infrastructure below it. So you want to avoid that cost because it, it eats into the economics of doing the project. Ground mounts are fantastic. From a standpoint of installing, it's safer, it's easier to maintain, it's easy to do inspections on, and the big one is you get a bump in production. So when we put a solar system in that's on the ground, you can point it in the right direction and have it at the right angle. If you can adjust the angles seasonally, because the sun changes in the horizon, you can further optimize the worst times of the years and the best times of the years when the sun is overhead. So your production numbers increase, so now you need less infrastructure to produce the same or more energy, but it might come with some additional costs because now you're building the infrastructure for a ground mount, whereas before you were just using a garage roof or a house roof. There is a market for off-grid people. There is a community of people that want to be independent, 
but we think that there's more opportunity and more benefit if we're able to offer the solar to a much bigger demographic. So there are more people connected to the grid than off-grid, and there's just more opportunity to have a bigger impact. So net metering is the most popular program that we deal with. So the idea with net metering is you would still have a system that's connected to the grid, but you wouldn't have to store all the energy. And as a net over the year, you would generate as much energy as you use for the year so that the goal is zero. I'm going to try and buy zero power from the grid because I'm always generating enough to offset what I need. So in the summer, you're producing more energy. That energy goes out to the grid as a credit. And then in the winter, maybe when your system isn't producing as much as it would be because it's covered in snow, and when the sun goes down and you need power at night, you have an excess amount of credit that you continue to draw from so that on the annual cycle, you're actually using as much power as you're generating or getting as close to as possible. Normally when we start net metering, the process of net metering, what we try and do is understand what is the consumption that we need to offset. And then we would design a system that would try and target 100% of that. There's usually no incentive to generate more unless there's a program available that incentivizes you to do more because there's a financial reward. So most people build for 100% offset plus or minus 5% because the weather can be different year to year. So you want to make sure that you're designing for the averages. And obviously, if you can reduce your amount of consumption, it could reduce the size of system that you need. So now most people are doing net metering because systems are more viable. You know, like in the last 10 years, panels have dropped by 80%. And battery pricing is starting to do the same. So now we're able to generate low cost of renewable energy and it's part of the energy mix of hydro and all the other things and wind, but now you can generate it yourself <laughs> and you can store it yourself and you can choose to run your home with it or you can participate in programs. So when the power goes out, a net metering system could also provide you functionality, but in order to get power when the grid's down, you need a battery and the battery starts to run the home and uses the solar to run the loads in the home. We're seeing a lot more of it because people see a lot more power interruptions and they have a perfectly good solar system on their roof that's doing nothing. So with a battery, your solar system continues to operate when the grid is gone. The battery technology is expensive, so it is an additional investment on top of the solar investment. And so it is a nice to have, but most people don't need the protection. Solar systems can be expensive, and I get that question a lot. People are like, I just like to buy a system, and they're like, okay, well, what, what do you need it to do? And they're like, well, I wanna run my entire house. Um, and so I go, well, it could be one panel, could be a hundred panels. So the context of it is, is really based on what your requirements are. So when people are starting to look at costs associated with solar, I usually recommend that they first do some personal investigation, and but they should set a budget of money that they have allocated to pay for the technology and try and figure out if they're borrowing and what programs are available, what rebates are available, and talk to somebody who's knowledgeable. So all, all of the technology has a design life. Panels come with 25 year warranties. Um, there's no moving parts. They're made of glass aluminum. So they're designed to last a really long time if they're installed properly. And then uh, racking systems, most of them are made from uh, aluminum or metal components that are also designed for, to last a really, really long time and can be recycled. Some batteries are designed to last for 10 or 15 years, but the technology continues to improve. There are customers that we recommend that solar is probably not the right choice for them. Like if they live in an urban setting where the availability of solar is impacted by tall buildings, trees, neighboring facilities, a new condo going up across the street, they're potentially not a good candidate. Like when we model a system, we have to keep that in mind and say, this system needs to exist for 20, 30 years. And we're designing and projecting that far out. So there are risks to installing solar. The technologies have a lot of certifications that are required so that there's less danger present on the roof and potentially less high voltage. But there's still a risk that you might have snow come off your roof if it lets go, slides off your roof. Or if you have a wind event, you could have panels that are damaged 
by debris. But if there's an issue with the system, they usually shut down and go into some sort of standby mode. But your roof potentially could be affected by a roof leak, ice damming. So you need to be aware of, uh, if you choose a good installer, that they are doing their best to make sure that the product is installed correctly. And potentially that involves doing building permits and structural assessments to make sure that you can mitigate any of the risks involved with installing solar. I mean, it's a very low risk. Like solar's been out for a long time and we've been building roofs for as long as man has been alive. Uh, so the idea of being able to install a system so that you, you have a very, very low probability of having an issue with a roof leak, that's just picking a good contractor and making sure they're using the materials correctly. So the risk is very, very low. Pretty much anybody could benefit from solar. And if you have the capacity, capabilities, financial resources to do it, the positive spin is the environment can also benefit. The world will be in a better place. Other people will become more aware of what technology is available. So that spin-off effect is tremendous. And that's what we've seen too with anybody who puts solar on, they talk to their neighbors and they share the successes of the project to allow other people to see maybe that benefit can apply to me. And in most cases it does because most people like electricity and use electricity on a daily basis. Subscribe to Exploring Alternatives and please share this video if you liked it. You can also find out more about iSolera at iSolera.com. Thanks for watching.